So, years ago I heard a pastor say, a preacher was saying the, what he thought was the best definition of a good sermon. And he said this, he said, a good sermon is a sermon that comforts the disturbed and disturbs the comfortable. Never forgot that. Often in my life I've been disturbed by messages. You know, God loves us with an unconditional love. It doesn't matter what you've done, doesn't matter where you've been, doesn't matter how much you've messed up, doesn't matter how broken you are, doesn't matter how messed up you are. You can come to God, God loves you and God accepts you as you are. But he loves you too much to leave you as you are. As we grow older, there are certain facts that we have to start facing and uh, facts of life, you know. And I've had to, over the last time, I've, uh, I've had to come to the realization that I don't have much opportunity of preaching and teaching left. Um, hopefully, by the grace of God, another year or two. But... Um, those times are becoming limited. And I don't want ever to just preach messages that are candy, candy floss, candy coated, feel good messages. I want to preach the truth. I want to preach the truth. And I've asked God to help me with the content. Because I want the content to help encourage, to challenge. And to strengthen believers. I want the content to help shape us to be more like Jesus. I want the content to help move us closer to God. And I want the content to help prepare us for heaven. Better prepared for heaven. Because all of us have an audience of one. All of us. It's appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. So I want, to be, I want to be better prepared for that day, and I want to help you to be better prepared for that day as well. May God help me to do that. The fact is that the more we know God and God's ways, I believe the happier and the more fulfilled and the more fruitful our lives will be. I, I, I realized long ago that the, more, the better I know Erica the more happy and the more enjoyable life is. If mama ain't happy, no one's happy. So I want to know what makes her happy. One of the things we did long ago is we did the five love languages, and I wish I'd done it a lot earlier because I think we'd be married over 20 years before we did it. I wish we'd done it a lot earlier. Five love languages by Gary, Dr. Gary Chapman. He believes there are five ways that we can interpret um, or understand love, express our love. And if you are number one and your wife's number four, well, there's going to be some sort of, you don't know what's wrong with this person. I mean, what, why don't they love me like I want to love? Well, I want them to love me, but they interpret love differently. And they express love differently. So that's a great course, by the way, which we want to do uh, in the first half of next year. And I want to encourage you uh, to, to do that. Even if you've done it five, ten years ago, uh, those things tend to morph a little bit, change a little bit over time, different seasons in our lives. So we're going to plan to do that in the first... Listen, there are three courses that I believe every church should be running annually. And one is a marriage enrichment course. Uh, the other is a financial one, you know, how to uh, better manage finances. And then a parenting course. I believe that, that's, that's a given. So Eric, I saw some. She sent me a video this week that um, that I want you to watch. Can we show that video, please? Nee, kom terug. Hey, kom terug. 
Yela khani aitni. Incredible. And I vote that we get this guy to come and do our parenting course next year. <laughs> huh? I mean, imagine that. I mean, he's, got, he's, he's, not a, he's not an elephant whisperer, he's an elephant screamer, but listen, I mean, imagine the power over, over elephants, what he can do for your children, eh? Yeah. Now, in Jeremiah chapter 9, God says this. Don't let the wise man or let the wise glory or boast in their wisdom. Don't let the powerful, the mighty man glory in his power. Don't let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glory glories or boast in this, that he knows me. The more we know God, the more enjoyable our lives are going to be, the more fruitful they're going to be, the more fulfilled they will be. Knowing God. I'll ask you a question this morning is, are you getting to know God better? Are you growing in your knowledge of God? Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 7. He said, not everyone who comes to me and says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the ones who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will come to me on that day and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons in your name? Did we not perform any miracles? And I will, and I will say to them, I never knew you away from me. You evildoers. Religious activity does not guarantee you a place in heaven. There are a lot of people who are not going to heaven, according to Jesus, who are very active religiously, doing a lot of religious stuff, but never knew God. It's not about religion. It's about a relationship with your heavenly Father. I never knew you, Jesus says. Do you know the Lord? I want to share with you this morning, it's not a, a three-point sermon, it's, it's more of a testimony. There's something that happened to me, a question that the Holy Spirit asked me over 30 years ago, but I've never forgotten it. And lately I just felt the Lord quicken me and say, I need to share this. So, Holy Spirit asked me many years ago, why is it that you're living with one foot in the kingdom of God and one foot in the kingdom of the world? Why is it as if you, you're living on the borders of blessing? You're not entering in to possess the life that Jesus Christ died for you to have. You're living on the edge. Awkward questions. Living with one foot in the church and one foot in the world. You know, there's some, some questions that you just can't answer. Do you know that God's children in the Old Testament, some of them also chose to live on the border of the blessing? Let me, let me catch you up. Just to remind you about the the Exodus. Some of you might know the story, some of you might not. But God's children were living in Egypt for over 400 years. They were slaves eventually to Pharaoh. And God, time came when God said, all right, he's going to set them free now. He's going to take them to a land where he wanted them to live, a land of blessing, a land flowing with milk and honey. And he sends Moses, and Moses Signs and wonders, eventually Pharaoh allows the children of Israel to go. 
And instead of marching straight to the land of Canaan, which some theologians tell us would have taken two or three weeks, God takes him on a detour through a desert for a year. If you are a child of God, I guarantee you that sooner or later God is going to take you through a desert. He takes all his children through a desert. Because there are certain lessons that we can only learn in the desert. The school of hard knocks, they call it. Because in the desert, God wanted to teach them that he was able to, to provide for them and to protect them, to sustain them, even in the land of lack, even in the desert. He was able to provide for them, miraculously. Manna. Every day. Every day they were fed. They never lacked. There's always food and water. God would provide for them. God would look after them because he loved them. Those are the, those lessons you can only learn in, in a desert. Jesus took his disciples into a storm to reveal himself to them. It was only in the storm that they, they finally realized that this guy has got the power over nature. Because he just stands up and says, peace be still, and the winds stop. The storm just dies down. And God wants you to know that he is able to do that in your life. But he can, you can only learn those lessons in a, in a storm. And so in the desert, God was teaching them a lesson. And eventually they move and they come to the land, the promised land. It's the land flowing with milk and honey. The land that God said they must go in and possess. And we know that they got there and they began to complain. Complained about the food. They complained about there's too many giants in the land. We'll never be able to inherit it. We'll never be able to possess it. We too small, they too big. They complained about the leaders, Moses. And in fact, you can, there's a scripture, there's a verse where they say, they actually said that it's the land of Egypt that is flowing with milk and honey. Let's go back there. Folks, there, are, there is no future in the land of Egypt. God has pronounced judgment on the land of Egypt. It's passing away. His kingdom will survive. But Egypt is going to be passing away. I'm going to ask Ilza just to read several verses from Deuteronomy just so that you understand the picture now as to where the children of God are. Thanks, Ilza. Deuteronomy 8. Be careful to obey all the commands I am giving you today. Then you will live and multiply, and you will enter and occupy the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors. Remember how the Lord, your God, led you through the wilderness for, 40, for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you manna, uh, a, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. For all these 40 years, your clothes didn't wear out and your feet didn't blister or swell. Think about it. Just as parents dis disciplines a child, the Lord your God disciplines you for your own good. So obey the commands of the Lord your God by walking in the ways and fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land of flowing streams and pools of water, with fountains and springs that gush out in the valleys and hills. It is the land where food is plentiful and nothing is lacking. It is a land where iron is as common as stone and copper is as abundant in the hills. When you have eaten your full, be sure to praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Do not become proud at that time and forget the Lord your God, who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. Thanks, Yolanda. So here's the, here's the thing. They, they get, they get to, the, to the border of the promised land after a year, but because that, that generation complained and were filled with unbelief, God said, if you want to go back, if you don't want to enter into the promised land, go back. And they wandered around in the desert for 40 years. 
until all of them, would, those 20 and older, died. There's a lesson to be learned if we don't want the things that God wants us to have. And God always wants the best for us. And so the next generation now, those, that generation's children come and are now camped on the border of blessing. God, the Bible says in Psalm, it says he brought them like a flock, carried them, uh, led them like a flock, and they came to the holy borders, the border of blessing. And in Deuteronomy, we also read, it says that he brought, Moses said he brought us out from Egypt to bring us into and give us the new land that he promised to our ancestors. So here's the situation. They camped, they're ready to enter in and inherit the fullness of the blessing, the new life that God wants them to have. And two and a half of the tribes, there were 12 tribes of Israel that, that were involved with the Exodus. Two and a half of the tribes came to Moses and said, hey Mo, we don't want to go. <laughs> In fact, they marched around his tent, there was a protest, marched around his tent and said, hey Mo, we don't want to go. No, it didn't, it didn't happen like that, okay, it didn't happen. No, they just came to Moses and it was the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh. They came to Moses and they said, Moses, we don't want to go over. We want to live this side of the Jordan. So you can read that that was their inheritance. That's what Moses gave them, their inheritance. Nine and a half tribes crossed over into the land God wanted them to have. Two and a half tribes said, oh, no, we're staying this side. And for the rest, after that, you will find that in the Bible, it refers to them living in the land Moses gave them and the nine and a half tribes living in the land God gave them. There's a big difference, folks, between living in the land where man wants you to live and living in the land God wants you to live. Big difference. And another thing, if you read the history, you can read further in, in Chronicles, for instance, you will find that the first people that were carried away captive, in other words, that were disciplined by God because of their backsliding. It was, the, it was the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh. You can read it in 1 Chronicles chapter 5. So the God of Israel stirred up the spirit of Pul, king of Assyria. Did you get that? God stirs up a pagan king. And he comes and he carries them away. And it says, and he carried them away captive. So the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh once again became slaves in a foreign land. Truth is, folks, God has taken us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. He's taken us out of an old life. And he's taken us into a new life. Jesus Christ died for you and me to live a new life. A life of blessing. A life where we are the overcomers. A life where we are the victors, not the victims. A life where we are more than conquerors. And the Holy Spirit asked me, Zane, why are you living with one foot in the church and one foot in the world? So allow me to ask you the same question that the Holy Spirit asked me. What is preventing you from fully committing, fully committing to the life that Jesus Christ died for you to have? Is it fear? Fear of what are people going to say about me when I become a real Christian? When I get sold, when I'm sold out for Jesus, when I become a fanatic. When I want to be in church every Sunday, be in a life group in the week. What are they going to say about me? What are my family going to say? What are my work colleagues going to say?
Proverbs says that the fear of man brings a snare. Maybe it's, it's unforgiveness that you don't want to let go of because, you see, if I follow Jesus fully, it means that I've really got to start doing the things that he told me to do. And one of them is I have to forgive everybody who hurt me. It's not a choice. It's not an option. Because Jesus said, if you don't forgive others that have sinned against you, your Father in heaven is not going to forgive you. It's not an option. It's difficult as it is. I have to forgive those who have hurt me. And it means if I follow Jesus fully, I've got to forgive people I don't want to forgive. Maybe it's just the pleasures of the world that you, you just don't want to let go of. You know, he said we're going to lose out if we become really fully committed. A real Jesus follower, I'm, I'm going to lose out. Je- you know, Demas, there was a guy called Demas in the, in the New Testament, one of Paul's teammates. He was on Team Paul. The greatest apostle that ever lived. Demas heard Paul preach, sat under his teaching, but we read about Demas that it says, and Demas, Paul writes and says, Demas has forsaken me for the love of this world. Maybe it's apathy. More comfortable living in between. In between two kingdoms. I want to get the best of both worlds here. So I have one foot in the church and one foot in the world. I'll give my Sundays to God, but hey, my Fridays and Saturdays, they still belong to me. I challenge you to go and read what Jesus says about lukewarm Christianity. You can find it in Revelation chapter 3, verse 16. He says it makes him sick. He said, you either be hot or you either cold. But don't be lukewarm, because I'll spit you out. Harsh words. So let me finish with a final verse. Background is that the children of God, nine and a half tribes have entered into the promised land. They're living there. But there are signs that, uh, and Joshua, at the end of his, towards the end of his life, he's led them in, he's, he's given them their inheritance. But he sees some signs that are not good. And he says to them, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your ancestors that your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, my family, we will serve the Lord. I thank God for his patience with me over the years. Patience and grace. I can say, I think like most, all of us can say what Paul said, I haven't arrived yet, I'm not complete yet, I haven't achieved yet, but one thing that I do, forgetting what is behind me, I'm pressing on. I'm moving forward to lay hold of that for which God has laid hold of me. Yeah. And I want to encourage all of you this morning too, if you're living with one, lay, one foot in the church, one foot in the world, I hope this word, this word is going to challenge you yeah. to fully commit, fully commit, fully commit to Jesus who died for you to live a life of victory. A life full of joy, a life full of peace. Amen, Tutsi Affair.